Thank you for downloading this podcast of The World at One from BBC Radio 4. But there are, of course, businesses which would like Britain to leave the EU. Simon Boyd is the director of John Reed & Sons, a steel construction company. Let's just take a look at the working time regulations. In our industry, we have a mobile workforce. They have to travel all over the United Kingdom. Some of our people work overseas. They're not office-based there's a recent ruling that's come out of a, a Spanish case ruled on in, uh, by the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg that travel time has to be classed as working time. If you look at an average week, if you're just travelling, you know, I don't think anybody would disagree that an hour, an hour each way commute isn't unusual, but that can add 10 hours to their working week. And if we haven't got the opt-out from the restriction on working hours, that's 10 hours that are taken out of that working week, 10 hours production that are lost. And it, it doesn't just damage the company, it damages all the people that work within that company. Well, David Cameron has continued the theme of the business case for staying inside the EU this morning. His first proper campaign stop took him to Slough in Berkshire to the HQ of the mobile phone company O2, which is owned by the Spanish company Telefonica. He was asked whether he was disappointed that there hadn't been more signatories amongst the FTSE leaders who wanted to remain in the EU. One of the reasons companies often find it hard to go forward is that they sometimes have to have board meetings and sometimes don't want to make any form of political statement. But I can tell you this, if the Leave campaign could produce 35 business leaders of this statute, of this sort of stature, they'd be over the moon. I would argue this is not business leaders telling people how to vote. This is simply people running some of the largest businesses in our country that employ over a million people between them saying this has real consequences for our country. Well, there were five full members of the Cabinet who decided to oppose David Cameron to join the Leave campaign. Among them is Theresa Villas, the Northern Ireland Secretary herself, who was a member of the European Parliament for six years. So today we have 198 business leaders signing a letter. That needs to be taken seriously, doesn't it? Well, of course people will want to listen to the views of business leaders, but I think it's clear that the business community has a divided opinion on this. And I think if you look through the 198 who signed the letter, I'm sure you will find names which, you know, 10 or 15 years or so ago were saying that the UK really had to join the euro and it would be a disaster if we didn't. Uh, they were wrong then and, and they're wrong now. I think the UK could flourish outside the European Union. But uh, I'm sure you'd accept that most businesses, certainly bigger businesses, are in favour. And what about this, the substance of the point that they're making today, which is about the risk to the economy? Uh, Alan Clark, an economist at Scotiabank, has written that if the UK votes to leave the EU, growth could slow by between 2 and 5% over the next couple of years. Well, I think we should be very wary of those kind of claims because they proved to be misconceived when people said that economic disaster would follow retention of our own currency when the opposite is the case. There's also a long list of businesses like Vauxhall, like Airbus, like GE, like Renault, all of whom have said they'll continue to work and invest in the UK even if we leave. And the reality is, you know, the, the EU you know, sells more to us than we do to them. So if we left, it would be in their interest to have a trade deal with us. So we'd carry on doing business with the rest of the EU, even in the event that we left. But if you look at the other countries who have made deals like this, and Norway, for example, that entailed continuing to pay money into the EU budget, accepting regulations and keeping free movement of people. Wouldn't the UK have to do the same? Well, I don't think we would. I mean, when you look at the list, you have if, if, if a country like Albania or Serbia or Montenegro or Bosnia can have a free trade deal with the EU without free movement, it doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's not unrealistic to expect that the UK would be able to secure that kind of arrangement as well. Or if you look beyond Europe, ch p countries like Chile and Peru and Colombia also have free trade deals without contributions, without free movement. You, we are a huge market for the EU. It would be in their interest to get a deal that works for us and for them. But you don't know that. You can't be sure of that. And if you look at the political reality of it, isn't it the case that the other EU countries are likely to want to drive a very high hard bargain in order in order to deter other countries from leaving well i mean if 
If the expectation of our European partners is they're going to be somehow sort of malevolent and want to punish us, how much more risky for us to stay in the European Union and be subject to being outvoted by these countries? I think that they will look at this this issue in with in a in a sense which respects the the exercise in democracy that we're going to go through. But above it, all, it is in their interest to negotiate a deal with the fifth largest economy on, in the world and one of their biggest markets, which is on their doorstep. But, but you can't be sure of the terms. And actually, you yourself accepted there's a risk. You wrote yesterday in the Sunday Telegraph, leaving is not without its risks. But the safer option is to leave. It is far more risky than forever to be condemned to potentially being outvoted on a whole range of issues in terms of how we regulate our economy, our businesses and our immigration system. I mean, we've been outvoted many times over recent years. We can guarantee that the European Court of Justice will continue to drive forward further political integration, further centralisation, further harmonisation, leaving us less able to take our own decisions about the future of our own country. And what about the way the campaign's being conducted? The Prime Minister said that the Treasury and the Bank of England are going to publish reports setting out the economic implications of Brexit. Are you worried that it won't be a level playing field because um, you, ministers like yourself won't have access to the civil service on this issue? Well, certainly the Leave campaign is the underdog. There's no doubt about that. Much of the establishment is lined up in favour of EU membership as they have been in the past. But I trust the people of this country to use their vote wisely. I think there is a good chance that people will decide that we need to revitalise our democracy by vesting decisions in the people we elected a general election and can throw out at a general election rather than institutions over which we have little influence in Brussels. Well, I want to move on now to your own portfolio, Northern Ireland, of course, and membership of the EU is certainly a very live issue there with big divisions between unionists and nationalists, the great fault line of politics, of course, in Northern Ireland. Well, our Ireland correspondent, Chris Buckler's reporting. Today, driving down the main Belfast to Dublin road, you barely notice when you cross the border. This is the main difference you'll see. In the north, the road signs are on miles per hour, while south of the border, they're in kilometres. People who live around here barely recognise the invisible line in the ground and they're used to crossing it on a constant basis to live, work and socialise. Matthew McGrean's farm is in Louth. That's in the Republic of Ireland, but it's just miles from the north. And he's worried that if the UK was to leave Europe, it would mean the return of some form of physical divide between counties and communities. We all remember what the border was like. There were paperwork, everything, you know, it would increase costs. I would fear what border control could do. The idea of a physical border brings back memories of a different time. During the Troubles in Northern Ireland, checkpoints and a major security presence marked where North met South. And while things would be different if a border returned, no one is sure if there would be controls and what they would be. There have been warnings that North-South relationships could be damaged by a British exit, and Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness has been very critical of the Conservative MP and Northern Ireland Secretary Theresa Villers for her decision to support the Leave campaign. My view is that if Theresa wants to be part of the, as she clearly does, the exit uh, campaign, uh, the proper and right thing for her to do is to step aside until such times as uh, that debate is over. This referendum is causing deep divisions at Stormont, just as it is in Westminster. Sinn Féin's partners in government, the DUP, supports an exit from Europe. Nigel Dodds is the deputy leader of the Democratic Unionists. We're recommending as a party that people uh, vote leave. It's entirely uh, uh, principled of Theresa Villiers to take the position she has, as it is indeed principled for cabinet ministers to take a contrary position. I mean, it's like saying that Martin McGuinness should now resign since he has taken his position contrary to the wishes of some people in Northern Ireland. So I think that's a bit of a red herring and a bit of a sideshow, um, quite frankly. But there are businesses worried. The Carrickdale Hotel over here, that's in the south of Ireland. We're in the north. Ovo manufactures products that allow flat pack furniture to simply snap together. It has offices both outside Newry in Northern Ireland and in Dundalk in the Republic. And Sean Phillips of the firm says they will have to look at their options if Britain doesn't stick with Europe. For us, if, if the UK was to pull out, we would definitely consider moving all our business into the south. Why? We do fear that it will make life awkward and it will make more sense for us to move 
our entire company basically into a European company. This referendum is full of reassurances, but on this shared island with the UK's only shared land border, this campaign is producing more questions than answers. Chris Butler. So if the UK did decide to vote to leave, what would the reaction be? Well, last month, Open Europe, a think tank that calls for reform of the EU, held a role play with 10 politicians, which imagined how the negotiations would unfold in that scenario. Former Taoiseach John Bruton represented Ireland and gave a very personal reaction. We regard it as an unfriendly act. I have invested, I speak personally, most of my political career in building a structure of peace in Ireland, reconciling two communities that live on the island who have entirely different allegiances. And now for entirely domestic purposes on the island of Britain, the British people have left the European Union and thereby created a structure of instability on the island of Ireland. John Bruton went on to warn about the complications that changes to border control could bring. He argued that if passport checks weren't introduced on the border between the north and south, but rather relocated to Stranraer and Liverpool, that would risk offending the unionist community in Northern Ireland and cause more unrest. Well, Theresa Villas is still with us. I mean, isn't the likelihood of, of Brexit, wouldn't that mean that you'd have to reintroduce some kind of physical border between Northern Ireland and the Republic? Certainly, that's not inevitable at all. I mean, we've always had a much closer relationship with the citizens of the Republic of Ireland than with the rest of the EU. There was a a common travel area which gave freedom of movement, which existed for decades before the UK and Ireland joined the EU. And indeed, it includes places like Guernsey and Jersey, who are not members of the EU. So it is perfectly possible to maintain that free movement with Irish citizens. After all, we give them privileges in the UK, which we accord to no other EU citizens, like the right to vote in our elections. But what would stop, say, all the migrants who are gathering at the moment in Calais, going to the Republic of Ireland and then going through the poorest border to the north and to the rest of the UK? So when your campaign talks about taking back control of the borders, it doesn't sound like you would be able to take control. Well, there, there are various different ways to manage that risk. And and actually, it, it's a risk right at the moment. I think it's certainly not impossible to manage that risk. In what way? Well, it is, you know, already there are you know, very close working relationships between the UK and Ireland in terms of immigration matters. We actually, for example, recently have started a scheme for joint visas from, from certain countries. We work together uh, because we are members of this common travel area. But you, couldn't, sure but you couldn't stop people, you couldn't stop migrants moving from the Republic into Northern Ireland without a physical border, could you? I think it's, you know, it's, it's entirely possible to continue with freedom of movement for Irish citizens. Um, and I don't think anyone should assume that border checks should be introduced as a result of a UK exit. I mean, after all, you know, the security situation is completely different from the period of the kind of security checks that you referred to before. I do think, again, we are in the the era of scare stories. We do need to recognise that the relationship between the UK and Ireland when it comes to this common travel area is decades older than our EU membership and doesn't depend on it. Would you be ruling out um, passport checks in um, in Stranraer and Liverpool then, reintroducing those? Well, as I say, we have um, run an effective common travel area for, for many decades with the Republic of Ireland and there's every reason to suggest that that would continue regardless of whether we vote to leave the European Union or whether we don't because it, it's manifestly in our interest to ensure that um, pe- ease of, of passage across the border between North and South is as easy as possible. No one is wanting to wind the clock back to um, introduce the kind of security checks at the border but, that there were during the Troubles. But nonetheless, businesses are very worried and we heard one company there who was saying in the event of Brexit he would relocate his company to the South to be part of a European uh, company, as he put it. So wouldn't that mean a loss of jobs in Northern Ireland? I think Northern Ireland would still be immensely competitive as um, outside the European Union. It has a phenomenally successful manufacturing base. You you have companies that are selling all around the world. And, you know, as we discussed before, you know, there are many large global companies that made it absolutely clear that they will continue to invest in the United Kingdom if we withdraw from the European Union. And And they wouldn't face the same kind of costs that come with EU membership at the moment. And what about your own position in this? Shouldn't you, as Northern Ireland Secretary, being neutral, many would say is the abiding principle of your job, shouldn't you have stepped aside during the campaign, as Martin McGuinness suggested? 
Well, I mean, I don't think it comes as any surprise that sometimes, you know, a Sinn Féin deputy first minister and I don't necessarily see eye to eye. I think it's perfectly reasonable for me to have chosen a side in this referendum. The great thing is that every single person in the United Kingdom, including in Northern Ireland, will get to take this decision. The big but, issue but is, is not how you're the being on the unionist side rather than the nationalist side. Well, there are there are a range of issues where the government um, has a different view from different political parties in Northern Ireland. It's not possible to be neutral on all these issues. Okay. Um, we, I will certainly be campaigning, but that won't get in the way of my duties as Northern Ireland Secretary. Theresa Villas, thank you for joining us. You can find more podcasts of documentaries and current affairs at bbc.co.uk slash Radio 4.